much, too much. Hey, I'm glad you're here today. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, can we bring the lights up just a little bit so I can see these folks better? Um, there we go. Uh, we talked last week, and if you'll open your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you want to open up your Bibles there. We talked uh, last week about the value of arguing. And uh, there's a question mark on that, and I'm talking about arguing, you know, fighting kind of arguing, not just uh, the reasoning kind of arguing, where we have these heated, uh, angry exchanges with each other. And, and uh, I was wondering about this, you know, we, 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 we have these kinds of things about all different kinds of subjects, though. We have them about important subjects, and we have them about not so important subjects, but does it really matter? I don't think so. Well, you can argue with me about it right now if you want to. <laughs> but I got the microphone and you don't. <laughs> so I'm probably going to win. But if you remember uh, the passage we looked at, it says that the Lord's servant must not quarrel. And that really applies to all of us. Instead, be kind to teach without keeping score, to gently instruct, and to pray. To pray, and then also remember that there's a spiritual battle that's taking place. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There's a spiritual battle that's taking place, and, and a lot of times we get kind of beat up by that when we're not aware of it. But the last thing is that we, we, we all, you know, we fall to this sometimes, and these things happen, and we need to learn to be able to forgive. We've got to be able to forgive. There's so much power in forgiveness. And, and, and we've been hurt and we've, we've said things that, that uh, we shouldn't say. We need to apologize. They've said things that they, you know, uh, probably shouldn't have said. We need to forgive one another. Apologize. Humble ourselves before one another. It really is, it's really the only way. Because if we just dig our feet in, guess what happens? Nothing. We, we end up being, uh, I wanted to use a, world, a word called recalcitrant, but I'm not sure what it means, so uh, <laughs> I, I won't use it. But we, we end up just stubbornly holding on to our position, and, and we get nowhere, right? And that's really not what I think the Lord wants for us as believers. That's really what I wanted to say. Now today, uh, I, we're going to move into chapter 3. Really, this idea about are we living in the last days? So let's look at chapter 3, and let's read verses 1 through 5. But mark this, he says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, There will be terrible times in the last days, and people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Boy, that's a list, huh? In verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would apply your word to our hearts, Lord, each one of us. As we look at this passage, you would speak by your spirit, by your word to those areas in our own lives that we need the the searchlight, the spotlight upon. Father, speak to us today by your word, we pray in Jesus' name. So, that's the big question now. Are we living in the last days? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big kind of question. When are the last days? That's another, that's another facet to this question. Are we living in the last days? When are the last days? Jim knows the answers to this one. He can always depend on Jim for this one, right? 
So are we? What do you think? Yes. You think we are? I think you're right. You know, the last days, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. When are the last days? He, he talks uh, about this. He, he says that it, they will be terrible. And this word means difficult. It means dangerous. It means furious, which is kind of interesting. And then, and then he goes on to talk about people. So it's not the days themselves. It's what is going on in the lives of people during these last days, during this time. The word last, really, it, 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 uh, it means, uh, well, it's, it's a Greek word that, have you ever heard of the term eschatology? It, it means the study of last things. And this word for last here means, is a, is a form of that word where we get the word eschatology. And so he's saying we're, we're you know, there will be terrible times in these last days, in the eschat days, these last times. So, you know, looking at the Scripture and studying God's Word, we have to say, well, when are the last days? And we, we, don't wanna, we, don't, we can't go just by how we feel. We, we want to go by what the Bible says, right? That's our guide. That's our foundation. That's what we listen to. Well, I want to say to you right now that the last days are now. The last days are now. But stay with me. Stay with me. It's not some future time. It's right now. It's, it's today. But they began at the time of Jesus. Say, wait a minute. I thought you said the last days are now. But again, biblically speaking, and I've got some verses to show you to, to back this up. They actually began, the last days actually began at the time of Jesus, technically. Stay with me. Stay with me. Look what it says here in Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, which we're talking about what? The Old Testament prophets, right? The Old Testament period. But in these last days, same exact words as we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in these last days he has spoken to us, how? By his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe these last days, he began to speak. He, Jesus came onto the scene. We all know, you know what that meant. He, he was born in Bethlehem. He, he lived and he, he went to the cross for you and I in Jerusalem, outside the city gates there. He paid the ultimate price. He was buried. He rose from the dead, ushering in a brand new era, you see. And so he's saying here, the writer to the Hebrews is saying here, it's now. It was then. It was then when the writer of the Hebrews uh, wrote those words. What about Peter? What did he say? He, that is Jesus, was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in when? These last times, you see. So, technically speaking, if you're going to look at the, the words, technically speaking, the last times began with this unveiling, the revealing, and the ministry of Jesus. Now, let that sink in for a second. So, that kind of, that's kind of a long time, isn't it? Kind of a long time ago. So... So the last days, the last times began with the ministry of Jesus, but will continue until he returns. Up to the very return of Christ. So what does that say? We'll talk about the times we're in now in just a minute, so be patient with me. What does that say about believers during since the time of Jesus if we're living in the last days what does that say about what we should be doing right that's really for me that's what uh, I'm I'm thinking about this is what we should be doing looking and watching and waiting for him living for him looking for his return 
You see, the early church, throughout the history of the church, even from those days, when we read these words that were written to the church then, of course written to us today as well, but written to the church then, they were looking, they were anxious for the return of Jesus. The early church, they wanted him to come right then. And, and I don't blame them. And, and, and I, you know, the, the, what Jesus said to them, I'm going to return. I'm going to come back. So throughout the history of the church, the believers have been looking for it. And it, it's, it, those that had this urgency that, that they were looking and watching, it affected the way that they lived. It affected the way that they lived, looking for the return of Jesus. We sing about it, don't we, in, in uh, that song in Titus? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? We sing that. That we should live a certain way because we're looking for that blessed hope that He could come at any moment. He could come at any moment, and, and I believe, I believe that, and I, I believe the Bible has, is teaching us that, that He could come at any moment. We don't know the exact day or the hour, and we need to be looking in for that blessed hope, the returning of our Savior Jesus. See, uh, when, we, when we're not concerned about it, and we don't really care, it, it, you know, our lives, uh, you know, they, they kind of have this kind of blah attitude. You say, okay, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm not sure I buy in it yet, but we'll talk again about these particular days. But, but if, if it began, these last days began with uh, the ministry of Jesus, isn't it kind of taking a long time? Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. What, did, what did Peter have to say? If you'll turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Again, we read in 1 Peter about him saying that these last times. But look at, at 2 Peter chapter 3 because, because he had the same idea, the same question. And as Peter is talking in this chapter about some of the very end time uh, things that would happen. Look at chapter 3 verse 3. 2 Peter 3 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last days... Same words. Scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised ever since our fathers died. Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens existed. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's a key to this whole question of why is it taking so long. He goes on in there and talks more about, you know, the day of the Lord, in verse 10, coming like a thief in the night. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So the way we live is affected by the fact, are we looking up? Are we looking? Are we hoping? We're looking for that return of Jesus? We don't know when it's going to be. It's, he says it's going to be like a thief in the night. We don't know how long it's going to be. The, the people in the ages in the Christian uh, history have looked and said, but, you know, I'm looking for him to come. And were they wrong to say, I'm looking for him to come now? No. It's not wrong for us now to say, in fact, it's the right thing for every one of us to say, I am looking for him to come now. Because now we are in the last days.
Now, thinking about this in terms of the days that we live in right now, we see this list of 18 things here back in 2 Timothy, right? And, and it's, it's kind of a crazy list, and, and just to read them all was kind of crazy. But, hold on, I lost my, uh, my place here. Oh, there it is. This, this idea of what's going on here, this continual decay, the continual decay of man's spiritual nature. As people neglect the spiritual dimension of life, they turn in upon themselves to find meaning. We kind of see that happening today, don't we? So the, so the question is, we've had the last days coming from the time of Jesus up till now, but looking at the times that we live in now, right? Looking at this list in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, trying to discern the times, trying to uh, determine, are we in the last days? Well, first of all, we are in the last days. But, but, obviously, just before he returns, there's going to be the last of the last days. So the question that we can ask, are we in the last of the last days? Are we in like that final hour, that time right before he's going to return? I don't know that we can know for sure, but it, but, 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 but as we look at the times that we're living in now, Warren Wiersbe says it's not just better news coverage. He says it's, it appears that evil is deeper and of greater intensity and that is being accepted and promoted by society in a bolder way. I would agree with that. However, I, I was listening to WRV uh, the other day and they also talked about how how uh, morally corrupt the Roman Empire was as well. And so many of the things that we see in our country today, the Roman Empire, you know, that was all like part and parcel of, of what they were all into. And Christianity came along and changed a lot of those things, helped to change a lot of those things. So some of these things, you say they're so bad today, but, but haven't they been bad in the last, during the last 2,000 two years? They have been. So for us to know, I think we need to be ready no matter what, right? Thinking this, this looks like what we're seeing, what we're reading here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. This looks like the kind of things that we're, that we're talking about. The society that we live in. In one uh, commentary, they said that it would be worse right before the end. The period just prior to the return of Christ, rebellion against God will reach new heights in its frenzy. All restraint will be loosed. Now, I look at America, and that, that, like, that like sums it up for me. But when I look around the world, though, it's not necessarily like every country is not like America in the depths of depravity that we are jumping into. But in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus talks about, you know, uh, reading the signs of the times. He says, you know, when you, when, when you see certain things begin to happen, he says, to stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. There, there, there are some things we need to look at and say, wow, it's really bad. It could very well be that the return is like imminent. And I think we have some justification for saying that for us today. Now, what if it doesn't happen for another 50 years or 10 years or 20 years or 100 years even. Pastor Cheka was, you know, he believed that the Lord would come for him during his lifetime, but he didn't. But is that okay? Did that, did that negatively affect the way he lived his life? No, I think it positively affected the way of his, he lived his life because he was looking and, and I want to be ready for you. I want to be ready when you come for me. I want to be living so that I'm not going to be surprised. I'm, I'm waiting, I'm looking, I'm watching. 
See, it affects the way we live, this whole, this whole idea that we are in the last days. The last days are now. Looking again at this uh, list of, of 18, and I, I think, yeah, here I am now. This list of 18, we see back to uh, 2 T uh, Timothy chapter 3. It, it's crazy stuff when you look at it all, right? It's kind of intense. But this decay that's happening, but, but look at, we're not going to look at every one of these because, you know, we would just get downright depressed, I think, if we looked at every one of these in detail today. But look at number one there, people would be lovers of themselves. Many of the writers that I read, they, they talked about this self-love. John Calvin said it's the source from which all the others that follow spring. Kind of begins with this loving of ourselves, focusing in on ourselves. Uh, Barclay said it's a, he said a life centered in self. And love of self is the basic sin from which all others flow. You see, we become like the center of the universe. This is the, you know, the, the thing about humanism. Humans are the center of the universe. And not just humans, but we. I become the center. I am the one. I love myself so much is the way we think. We've really been taught that, haven't we? You really need to focus on yourself. You really need to love yourself. We have popular songs that you know, brought all this out. But what happens is as we, as we uh, turn in that quote upon ourselves to find meaning, we neglect the, the, the deeper things and the, the spiritual dimension which is focusing on God. And what it actually is, is idolatry. Because if the, the definition of idolatry is anything that takes the place of God in our hearts. And so as we put ourselves there, that's what we're worshiping. That's idolatry. God is the only one that deserves our worship. Someone pointed out this, the kind of the, the progression in our society anyways, uh, in terms of the magazines that come out, right? First there was Life magazine, right? And then there was People magazine. And then there was Us magazine. And then there was Self magazine, right? It's just the progression. And, and, and uh, this, this guy said, well, the next thing is going to be Me magazine. <laughs> But, but we're already there. We don't need the magazine. That's kind of where we are. It's all about, right, it's all about me. Lovers of themselves. I mean, it goes on. Again, we're not going to look at all these, but, but, but lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents. This is all real stuff that we see in our society. Now, we don't know a lot about what happens in other societies, so let's just think about ourselves, and that's all we have to go by. But these are what we see. We look around, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's a total selfishness, isn't it? It's because we're wrapped up in ourselves. Wrapped up in me. We call evil good and, and we call good evil. But you know, before we move on to the last verse I want to look at today, I want to say, I, I think reading these verses, I think you and I, we need to check our own hearts. You know? He says the world's going to be like that. People, and we, it's easy for us to say, well, I'm a Christian, and it's those people out there that are not. You know, the unbelieving world, the pagans. But I think we need to apply these things and go through this list for ourselves. Am I? Have I been caught up in, in this? Am I, you know, you know, just enamored with myself? Am I, you know, enamored with money? Am I boastful, proud, abusive? Apply these things to ourselves. It's not just them over there. I think that's very important because looking at verse 5, look at verse 5, what does it say there? Having a form of godliness but denying its power. 
You see, he kind of goes right from this list to that. All these things that he's just mentioned, all those above things, and, there, and we, we, I think we would all agree that they don't, it's not a pretty picture. It doesn't look good, right? But he says, after all those things, having a form of godliness. He kind of adds that to the list. Having a form, an outward form of godliness, but denying the power. In other words, this idea of professing to believe Professing to believe and to be right with God, but not necessarily true. Having a form of godliness. You know, I read this about America. This came out July 18th, just, you know, weeks ago. ABC News did a survey, or they're reporting on a survey, a poll. And he said, uh, ask Americans their religion and you'll get an earful. 50 individual answers in an ABC News belief net poll ranging from agnostics to Zen Buddhists. The vast majority, though, have something in common. What is it? Jesus Christ. 83% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. 83% identify themselves as Christians. I'm sorry, but I don't see it. That's like the vast, that's a super majority, right? If 83% were, like we're reading here, you know, not just the form of godliness, but the power of God working in their lives... We would see something different in our country, I'm afraid to say. You know, again, comparing our country to other countries, he says uh, here that that's quite different from the world at large. The rest of the world, uh, it's more like one-third say that they're Christians. So we're like, we're like saying we're, you know, we're 83%. We're all, this is a big Christian nation and everything, but you know what? I'm not seeing it. Something going on here. There's some deception that's happening here, some unreality, but it's like what Paul is saying right here. Pro professing to believe, there's this form of godliness, but denying its power. There's this religion without reality. We, we make this profession one writer says, a profession of Christianity, but our actions speak louder than our words. We're living a lie. There's no evidence of the power of God in our lives. No evidence of the power of God in our lives. If we are truly born again and not just some kind of a, an outward show, some kind of a form, some kind of a you know, picture, if there's no power of God in our lives, you know what? It's not real. I think what he's talking about here, the power he's talking about, is the power of God to, to change our lives. Warren Wiersbe said this too, there's plenty of religion in the last days, but a form of godliness without the life-changing power of God. Without the life-changing power of God. You know what, I don't want to be in that category. I don't want to be like that. I mean, this is, this is like fits right in with this whole list. You know, he says it's going to be terrible, furious, ugly, bad. You can have this form of godliness, but, but denying its power. There's no power there. And uh, looking at this, kind of looking at this in two different ways. One, saying no to the power of God to work in my life, in our lives. Not giving him an opportunity. We say, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, I'm, I go to church, I even attend church, I even go there every week, sometimes. <laughs> but is God at work in your life? Have you allowed him to come in and like and take over? Have you allowed him? Because if you haven't, it, you're denying the power, you're saying no to him. But the other side of it is too, is that Denying the power, if, if, if that's not happening in our, in our lives, it's a denial. 
There's no evidence. That's like our country, you know, 83%. We're Christians. But there's not much evidence in our society, is there? Are you seeing 83% of evidence? I'm not seeing it. That's heavy stuff, isn't it? Heard someone taking a deep breath. <sighs> yeah. The question is, is that us? We have to apply this individually to ourselves. You know, it's not just those people out there, all those out there. But is God working in me? Is, have I surrendered to Him? Is the power of God working in my life? Or am, am I just going through these motions? I've got this form. I look like Joe Christian. Right? And, and, I, and I carry a big Bible and everything, but there's nothing happening inside of me. That's scary. That's wrong. That's what he's talking about here. And it's part of this whole list. It's all self, self, selfish. He says, from such turn away. He says, have nothing to do with them. Are we hanging out with people who just, it doesn't change, the, the, their faith isn't changing them at all in any way, shape, or form? And again, that doesn't mean we don't ever talk to people who are not walking and following and surrendered to Jesus because we'd have to go out of the world. We're going to do that one day. Right? We're supposed to be light and salt in the world. But who we hang out with? Are we just living like the world? Is that the kind of the life that we have? Is there any difference? Can people see any kind of difference? And they see God in our lives? That's the question. So getting back to our first thought, the last days are now. And if we are looking for his return at any moment, how will that affect how we live? Are we just going to have a form or are we going to be real? Truly live for him today. Because he could come at any moment. We're listening for his voice. We're, we're truly following Jesus. It's not just a, a show. It's not just some kind of an outward appearance, but reality. Because I do believe we are in the last days, no matter how you look at it. And the last days are now. The last verse I want to quote before we close is this, Revelation chapter 22, 20. It's the second to the last verse in the New Testament in the Bible. He who says... He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's our response, right? Jesus said it. He said it then. Yes, I am coming soon. And that's the attitude that you and I have. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. And for us to say, Amen, I'm ready. I, I want you to come soon. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, uh, kind of heavy-hitting words here today uh, that for, for all of us. Uh, where, where's our heart? Where's our attitude? Are we just so wrapped up in this world and so wrapped up in ourselves, we're not even looking for your son Jesus to return for us. We put aside the blessed hope. Father, forgive us, Lord. Help us to get our eyes fixed back on you upon your word, upon what your word says, that you're coming soon, Jesus. And we want to be waiting. We, we read about all those in the, that Jesus talked about who weren't ready. They got all caught up in everything around them. They didn't, they didn't have what, it needed, what they needed to be ready. We want to be ready, Lord. We want to live for you today. We want it to be reality, not just religion. Father, work in us, Lord. We surrender to you. And, and as, he, as he, we even go through this list, Lord, apply it to ourselves. Maybe there's one area that just kind of stands out. Well, that's me. Help me, Lord. Let your power work in my life to change me. From the inside out, we, we sang about it today. Change me from the inside out. Do something in me, Lord, by your spirit, by your power. I have no power to change myself, but you have all the power that's needed to work in me, that which is pleasing to you.
Lord, I also pray this morning for any here as we want to give an opportunity, Lord, to any that might need to surrender their lives and be right with you. To be ready for heaven, to, to know that the, the blood of Jesus Christ covers our sin, that we come to the cross and we believe that Jesus died for me, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead for me. And I receive that. And I believe that. Maybe that's you this morning. I, I want to give you an opportunity right now to pray and, and simply ask him in and say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me. I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm a selfish sinner. And I need, I need to be saved by you, the Savior of the world. Save me today. Work in me today, Lord. I want to live for you today. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and sing together, shall we?